Hi, my name is Dr. Jim Bell. I'm the Medical Director of St. Luke's Palliative Care and Hospice at St. Luke's in Cedar Rapids. I'm privileged to be able to speak with you today about the Iowa Physician Order for Scope of Treatment, uh, known as IPOST. I do not have any financial interest to disclose. IPOST is a piece of paper, and what it uh, does is to fill a gap that we've had in healthcare a practical gap between the ideas of what is really presented on an advanced directive uh, and the way that we would actionize those orders in real life. And so a number of years ago, the POLST movement began uh, on the West Coast in uh, Oregon and Washington. Uh, and we have modeled our IPOST forms after the national POLST paradigm. For anyone who's interested, the uh, POLST website would be polst.org. Uh, and I have a couple of slides in the presentation here that uh, will show kind of what's happening nationally with iPost. My goal for today is to help you as providers to basically understand how to walk a patient through filling out a, an iPost. And this is a condensation of training that really, um, in its best form, takes about a day and a half. And we'll talk about the uh, integrity of the process of uh, training trainers and facilitating these conversations. Um, but not all providers have a day and a half to spend uh, learning how to help folks fill out this form. And so uh, our approximately 45 minute session here today uh, is really, again, a condensation of that training process in a way that ho hopefully can be practical to you. So the piece of paper, the iPost form, and we'll uh, show some slides that illustrate the form, uh, really summarizes uh, patient preferences for key decisions and choices uh, in the area of life-sustaining treatments with respect to CPR or the do not resuscitate question, uh, general scope of treatment uh, in the event of change, uh, and specifically with artificial nutrition by feeding tube. So what this does again is to complement the advanced directive by translating these choices into actionable medical orders with a doctor's signature or provider signature at the bottom of the form, which can be carried out immediately uh, and are protected by Iowa law. The IPOST form is not uh, a document that, uh, like an advanced directive, everyone should have. Um, most of us have or should have an advanced directive that states kind of in a philosophical way what we think uh, would be the general treatment choices that we would want in general situations uh, if our clinical uh, case should be futile uh, or near futile. What that advanced directive requires is that two physicians would say that we are terminal uh, and that the uh, situation is such that we would not be able to make our own uh, wishes known at that time. So most of us, again, should have kind of that philosophical advanced directive. An iPost uh, is intended for that population who really will be needing the answers to those kinds of questions answered in a specific way, probably in a fairly uh, reasonably short period of time. So a chronically seriously ill who is in frequent contact with the healthcare system, maybe by hospitalization, maybe by virtue of being in a long-term care facility, um, maybe by virtue of being uh, in transition between those types of places, or someone with a clearly life-limiting illness, the generally frail and elderly population where it could be anticipated that the trajectory of things is going to be changing, and also, very importantly, medically appropriate persons under age 18. Uh, you may be aware that the um, Iowa law has, up until this time, uh, excluded children from the out-of-hospital DNR uh, and uh, this actually does include children who would be appropriate uh, for this type of a medical conversation. So again, what we're addressing is breakdowns in care and uh, trying to fill a gap that to this time really has not been met. Many of us are aware of the uh, typical story of midnight or two o'clock in the morning, the nursing home patient experiencing fever or uh, respiratory decompensation or chest pain. And uh, maybe they do have an advanced directive. It might be buried somewhere. 
maybe um, the family is available and everybody knows exactly who's going to be called, but oftentimes uh, they're not readily available. And so uh, asking the question of a power of attorney or a surrogate decision maker when you have to know the answer to the question right now is not a pragmatic thing to do. So what results is medical care that really is contrary to the choices of the patient and the family. Uh, people don't get what they want or they do get what they don't want. So again, what we have had up until this time uh, in place is uh, the out-of-hospital DNR. The restriction of the out-of-hospital DNR is that a patient must be declared to be terminal. Uh, it uh, is only for adults over 18, um, and it has not been used uh, in long-term care facilities. When the uh, trigger is pulled, and whether it's from home or from a long-term care facility again, uh, when we activate the emergency medical uh, services, the default setting is to intervene uh, with a goal of preserving life. And while that's a laudable goal, it's not always uh, compatible with the wishes of a patient who particularly may wish uh, primarily to be kept comfortable. And so what this creates is a dichotomy uh, in care and, and desired uh, interventions where uh, the emergency medical services and on into the emergency room and on into the hospital are called upon to uh, preserve life at all costs unless they are instructed specifically to do otherwise. And again, this can be simply uh, counterintuitive or not desired by the patient. But once it happens, it happens. And so uh, the wheels start turning, the snowball starts rolling down the hill, and it's very difficult to stop it. And so uh, even with the presence of an advanced directive, since that is not a specific order, many, many times uh, the wishes that are expressed in that document cannot or are not followed. Other issues uh, in the gaps that really occur in uh, especially transitions in care um, are that decision making can be inconsistent when the uh, in the heat of the moment sometimes goals get confused and the implementation of goals is just very difficult because it's a panicky meltdown kind of a situation. So the time to talk about uh, how I want to be cared for at that time is really not at that time, it's before that. Um, and lastly, there's a great deal of fragmentation and communication between providers. The transmission of medical orders, uh, medication orders, care orders, um, again, between care settings, between the hospital and a long-term care facility or hospital and home, with or without home health care, back into the emergency room, um, that communication is just often simply dropped. So the iPost is meant to fill those gaps and hopefully it'll become clear how that happens. Uh, this is one of the questions that we have seen pop up very frequently in our pilot project and I'll talk a little more about the pilot. And uh, as we move this into Iowa law, uh, who is it that actually implements the iPost? And the important uh, point here is the third bullet, and that is that the, the most important factor in implementing the iPost is to maintain the integrity of the process. It's to have the right conversation with the patient. It's less important who's, um, what the initials are after the name of the person holding that conversation. And so in our pilot project, many of our trained professionals in uh, implementing the iPost and in having the conversations regarding goals of care would be social workers, nurses in a care facility, sometimes even the administrative people who really care about this and are willing and able to learn how to talk about it. So the conversation uh, usually takes about an hour uh, when we um, sit down and expect to do goal setting conversation that will result in the implementation of an iPost form. And uh, it's best to do that really in the context of a family meeting so that everybody hears the same thing at the same time. So the trained facilitator would lead that conversation. Now, only a physician, PA, or a nurse practitioner uh, can sign the form. So those providers are very much uh, able, uh, if willing, to have the conversation. Uh, but again, many 
uh, providers don't have that t kind of time to sit down and do it. So what they can do is to validate that uh, conversation, especially if they know the patient well, and uh, sign the form. So the signature at the bottom by the provider indicates that he or she would know well enough that the conversation that took place that resulted in the IPOST form being filled out was uh, acceptable and logical and uh, correct. Uh, so again, the most important thing is that the right conversation was had. This is the form, and uh, we'll go through the sections uh, one by one, uh, but to just get a glance at the front side, and then on the next uh, slide, I believe, is the back side of the form. So the uh, form uh, is going to be uh, housed by the Iowa Department of Public Health, and the host uh, really at this point in time, uh, at this recording, is going to be the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative. So uh, we will have, I think, at the very end of this presentation, connections to the website for the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative and the IDPH. So this form will be downloadable and uh, will be printed on salmon cardstock uh, in the state of Iowa. And the uh, process of getting through the uh, I post in any given town uh, or area of our state um, is hopefully going to be uh, moving out uh, from Lynn County and Jones County where our project uh, began in a way that is uh, reproducible, planned, and uh, well implemented. And again, one in which the training um, is present and the coalition of people uh, who will implement the IPOST uh, in any given area uh, would be uh, uh, very aware of what, what is happening um, so that right now it would not be a good idea, for example, to um, download this form um, in Sioux City um, and print it off and have somebody fill it out um, because in those areas where we, where we really haven't developed the coalitions uh, well yet, that would be a very uh, difficult situation, for example, for emergency medical services who haven't been uh, educated about what the IPOST is to implement. So uh, in, in uh, the areas in uh, Iowa where uh, this will be implemented, um, we need to think ahead, we need to plan ahead um, and have the um, coalitions uh, ready uh, so that by the time we're downloading and printing and uh, having the conversations with the forms, everybody knows what to do with it. So as I do this presentation today, th this is really not a talk about um, how it's going to unroll um, in any given community. This is really a talk about a provider being able to walk through the form once that process is in place. I hope that's clear. So on the form, there are three sections you'll see here uh, that relate to uh, medical choices, and then section D relates to who uh, made the medical decisions and why. This is the backside of the form, and not so uh, critical in terms of the provider uh, knowing or filling out the form, but the blanks that are uh, available there uh, that can be filled in uh, would be the person's name at the very top and the surrogate decision maker and their contact information. And then again, the healthcare professional preparing the form. So there are also instructions uh, for those professionals who may come into contact with an iPost and not be familiar with it for exactly what it is, how to complete it, um, uh, bullet points on that, um, using it, voiding it, um, and transferring it. And one of the things that we added after uh, the review by the Iowa Department of Public Health before this was signed into state law is a periodic review um, of the IPOST form uh, and uh, an ability to date that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk as well. So this is the nationwide picture of the areas in the country where there are endorsed POST programs uh, like IPOST and uh, developing programs. Iowa, as you can see, is uh, a light pink state and uh, very, very soon to become a dark pink state. Uh, we had to wait really until um, we had a plan in place uh, for the statewide implementation of the program. 
again, carried by the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative and administered through the Iowa Department of Public Health uh, before we would really get our full ratification from the post paradigm. But if you went to Colorado or California or Oregon or Washington or New York, right now you would um, encounter forms that are very, very much like the iPost form uh, as the uh, post paradigm wants this to be a fairly universally uh, uh, visible and uh, recognizable form. So uh, m most everywhere you go where there is a post type document, it's gonna look like ours. All right, just a little bit of history about iPost. So uh, we um, in Lynn County were authorized to do a pilot project by the Iowa legislature in 2008 for two years, and then we expanded that to Jones County as the rural uh, pilot site in 2010. Uh, so each of those were, were two years. There was oversight provided by the Iowa Department of Public Health, and there was a state advisory group that at the end of that four-year pilot went to the uh, back to the legislature and uh, recommended adoption of that into state law. Governor Branstad signed the iPost into state law on uh, March 7th of this year, and it became operational uh, July 1st. And again, operational really means that it's legal to use this form in Iowa. And what we hope is that the rollout of the use of the form is going to be a gradual process and one in which in each community in our state uh, or region, uh, there is a uh, proscripted uh, way of uh, implementing that with a coalition in each area. So uh, the um, focus group initially we established in 2006, and um, what I think is important to probably point out there is that um, in a community where you want to do iPost, and we hope that eventually that's universal in the state of Iowa, uh, all of the uh, stakeholders that would be interested in this kind of a conversation would be at the table. And so that includes the hospitals, home health agencies, long-term care, uh, pharmacies, emergency medical services, um, the legal profession, uh, sometimes the um, local um, churches and faith communities, anyone who really would have an interest and um, particularly those who might uh, feel like this would be a negative impact um, really need to be invited into the conversation. Uh, so uh, uh, just a couple of other fun facts about our uh, iPost uh, pilot. Um, again, I mentioned that we were piloted in Lynn County for two years. Uh, we were the first pilot in the country that was actually directed by the state legislature. And that was after um, initially thinking that perhaps we could do the iPost um, outside of the legislate, legislative um, type of drive, but realizing fairly quickly that uh, the protection, uh, particularly for, for uh, malpractice, uh, would be uh, much, much better if this was legislatively uh, protected, and so it is. Uh, the important thing probably about the legislation here, um, again, is that this um, isn't, is a doctor's order, um, just like an A1 order in a hospital, um, but it is implemented all, all across healthcare settings. So um, all of those things that I listed from the hospital to uh, home or long-term care to the emergency medical services, um, back into the emergency room, um, it can be operationalized right away. Um, it does not require a terminal status or have age restrictions like the out-of-hospital DNR. The uh, expansion of our pilot into Jones County uh, in 2010 um, really proved to be a very interesting thing. There are things that are different about rural counties, um, particularly um, in the area of emergency medical services, for example, that, that make things different. And so we learned some things. Um, about uh, rural uh, implementation that are different than urban and most of our counties in Iowa, of course, are rural counties. All right, well, we'll dig right in here. And the uh, first section of iPost is relatively simple. That is, if I'm found without pulse or breathing, should you attempt to revive me or not? And um, oftentimes that's kind of a casual question and it can be phrased differently um, in the emergency room. Things like, you wanna live, don't you? Um, or uh, if your heart stops, do you want us to restart it, which sounds kind of like turning a light switch on. And so 
um, oftentimes the casual conversation about CPR or do not attempt resuscitation um, is one in which um, the desire of a person to be alive really supersedes and um, leads to an erroneous kind of quick uh, conclusion that of course you would want to have CPR. Uh, what we're trained to do in the IPOS training, and I'm going to give you really quickly here, is um, that things don't always work like uh, they do on TV. Um, so uh, th historically, CPR was actually described in jo at Johns Hopkins when they started to do coronary bypass surgery in 1959, um, and it was intended just for that population who had a sudden post-operative cardiac arrest, and they, are, they described 70% return of spontaneous heart rhythm. Now we have expanded the statistics uh, in many, many different directions. So not only do we have return of spontaneous circulation, but we have survival to hospital discharge, survival at 30 days, six months, and one year. Um, what's important to probably realize and to kind of transmit to our patients is that in the uh, 50 years or so that we've been doing CPR, we really have not improved statistics in terms of survival. Um, while there is that range of 20 to 50 percent return of spontaneous circulation, if you look at survival to hospital discharge in patients who have CPR, if you take all comers, the average is about 15 percent. There are things that will uh, lower that average. There are not very many things that will raise that average. Um, survival is worse if you are over 70, if you have tachycardia, bradycardia, um, hemodynamic instability, or hypoxia. That drops you immediately unto, under 10% uh, chance of survival. Um, the chance of surviving a witness arrest is 22%, about 1% if it's unwitnessed. In an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the outcome is very poor. Um, one of the worst places to be if you're going to uh, have to undergo CPR is in a nursing home. They did a study in 92 showing 20% return of spontaneous circulation and no, per, no patient survived to hospital discharge. I believe that study was actually repeated relatively recently and it was exactly the same result. No one survived to hospital discharge if they had an arrest in a nursing home. Specifically with respect to cancer um, and other predictable terminal illnesses, um, sometimes when we talk to patients uh, about whether they would want to have CPR, it's important to be able to tell them as best as we possibly can with respect to their specific situation what the likelihood would be um, if they were to survive. And so sometimes we tend to lump all people together uh, and you know, ask these questions. Um, but if we can give them better information, they're entitled to that. So if you have a solid tumor like lung cancer or colon cancer, um, your survival is going to be better than a hematologic malignancy. And in my day-to-day -day career, um, one of the things that I worry about the most is someone, for example, with um, myeloma uh, or um, chronic leukemia who would get into an intensive care setting and perhaps be septic and be facing that possibility of an arrest, um, who is a full code because the, the truth of it is um, they are not going to survive um, resuscitative attempts. Um, and they need to be told that. Uh, if a patient is outside of the ICU, resuscitation is actually more successful than if they're in. Uh, and if the arrest is unexpected, survival is better than if it's the endpoint of a progressive, predictable downhill trajectory. So if we follow the evidence base, the likelihood of surviving CPR is extremely low for people who are in nursing homes, for people with whom CPR has begun outside the hospital, and for those whom cardiac arrest is the inevitable result of the, of the progression of an irreversible illness. Um, we need to be honest and we need to be frank uh, and transparent with our patients so that we can provide them the best care. And one of the things that I say to people is, you know, we like to do things that work and we really don't like to do things so much that don't work. And if I can tell you um, with a great deal of certainty um, whether what I'm going to do to you is going to work or not, um, I at least owe you that conversation. All right, moving on to section B. Uh, and this actually, uh, in the timeline of the conversation, tends to take up the most amount of time. So what we see here, I'm going to try to dissect um, fairly uh, quickly and efficiently for you. There's basically three sort of ways of thinking um, about caring for a person 
who's in a frail, uh, fragile state with a fairly uh, high likelihood or potential for deteriorating um, and asking what we should do when they deteriorate. Um, so these are people typically with uh, congestive heart failure, COPD, um, perhaps neurodegenerative diseases like uh, dementias and maybe um, comorbid situations like aspiration um, or cancer, uh, sometimes uh, chronic diseases like end-stage renal disease where maybe they're on dialysis and um, people who, again, are touching the medical system, perhaps being rehospitalized relatively frequently or, or are going to be um, predictably. And so uh, the questioning is, uh, once uh, a person is in a relatively compensated state and they arrive at their destination, uh, their living uh, situation, and they decompensate, what is the goal of care? Um, so I'm gonna go from the bottom up. Full treatment obviously is simply that. Um, so that means you should do everything you possibly can to keep me alive. You should take me to the hospital. You should put me in the intensive care unit. I would be happy to be on a ventilator um, and uh, try to revive me uh, if my heart stops. To uh, begin to forego things from there, you move up to what we would call limited additional interventions. Lots and lots of people end up in this territory. They've maybe been in an intensive care unit and maybe been on a ventilator, um, and they know that uh, whatever else happens, they don't want to do that again. Um, so they're willing to do things like come back to the hospital and have IVs and antibiotics and maybe go on BiPAP um, or maybe have pressors, uh, but they know that there are some boundaries of things that they don't want to do. And we can be very specific with that, where you see the line at the bottom that says additional orders. Um, for example, a patient who uh, has COPD um, may accept BiPAP and they might accept it for a few days. And you probably don't want to put the few days down there, but you probably do want to put that BiPAP is reasonable. Um, some people feel terribly claustrophobic on BiPAP. And if you have a patient, for example, with uh, aspiration pneumonia, recurrent aspiration because they're demented. Um, BiPAP is a little bit less uh, intuitive in a situation like that if they're in respiratory distress and if they've been on it. And um, sometimes those folks tend to be just extremely agitated um, and feel claustrophobic with that BiPAP mask on. You might put in the additional orders there that if they're going to go to the intensive care unit for some other reason, they don't want to have BiPAP. Um, so you can um, get pretty specific uh, in terms of the menu of options. And I would caution against getting too specific, um, but in generalities, uh, you wanna be able to uh, put down what boundaries are, especially where people don't wanna go. So um, that limited ad additional intervention says, um, I'm very happy to do things to um, continue to live longer um, but there are some boundaries. The top box there is comfort measures only. And what that says is really the goal of my care is for comfort. That doesn't mean that I wouldn't go to the hospital, but it probably means I would only go to the hospital if you couldn't keep me comfortable anywhere else. Um, it doesn't preclude using medications. Um, it doesn't really preclude interventions. I've seen people with an eye post that has a comfort measures only um, come in with um, foreign body in the esophagus and undergo um, upper GI endoscopy to get that foreign body out um, because that's certainly part of good comfort care. So um, it doesn't preclude interventions. It doesn't preclude medications. What it does is to state the goal of care is for comfort. Uh, and again, uh, what the um, general picture of that type of care uh, is uh, generally means not to bring to the hospital unless they can't be comfortable elsewhere, but you could conceivably uh, cross through that and put something else on the bottom if there's a specific thing. Um, for example, uh, patients maybe who are transfusion dependent with a uh, hematologic situation. Um, and you, you might want to clarify on there, um, patient is willing to transfer to the hospital for transfusion. So those are the three general uh, territories of uh, medical interventions um, that we get to. 
Um, and again, the benefit of this is, uh, and we see this now uh, in Lynn County and Jones County, where we've been doing this for a few years, patients showing up from the care facility in the emergency room and the emergency room providers being able to clearly see uh, what the boundaries are so that if the patient is to be admitted to the hospital, um, they're not going to the intensive care unit, for example, or sometimes it's a turnaround situation where um, they show up and their IPO says comfort measures and they do whatever is necessary to keep them comfortable and then get them back to the care facility. So it can be very pragmatic in terms of helping to know, not 100% prescriptive, but very, very helpful. I think we went through most of the things that are on this slide um, that give you some leeway in the additional orders section. I might make a comment here uh, that uh, you could state on the iPost form if a patient uh, for some reason specifically did or did not want to have antibiotics or fluids. In the national post paradigm, those are intentionally left off of the form because uh, sometimes fluids are part of comfort and sometimes fluids are part of standard care. Same thing with antibiotics. And so in order to avoid that confusion, uh, it's best not to have that as part of the automatic rules uh, of implementation, um, but rather uh, that if a patient's goal is for comfort and fluids are part of comfort today, then they would get fluids. Um, and the same thing with antibiotics. And so sometimes antibiotics are part of being comfortable and sometimes they're part of prolonging suffering. And uh, so whichever one it is simply needs to adhere to the general goal of care. All right, uh, one of the cruel ironies of IPOST uh, is that uh, in the hospital, um, either there's an electronic medical record or a paper chart with barcodes on it. And you do not want to have a, an eye post with a barcode on it that is a permanent part of the medical record. And the reason for that is because the eye post can change. So if the patient's goals of care should change, you don't wanna have something scanned into their hospital record that says differently. So um, unfortunately, um, when the eye post reaches the hospital with the patient, uh, what really needs to happen is that the information on that uh, eye post can be acted upon immediately, but in terms of the or orders for the hospital record, it needs to be transferred into whatever appropriate form is in the record. So that would typically be uh, a DNR form, uh, for example, with those specifics on it. Uh, so at St. Luke's and Cedar Rapids, where I work, again, our DNR orders um, are very specific about unit transfers, pressors, uh, non-invasive ventilatory support, and antiarrhythmics. And so those can all be yes or no um, answers. And it's not all usually necessary to go back and talk to the patient about that. Again, it just needs to be the um, orders need to transfer across. Section C on the I post is uh, again about artificially administered nutrition. And as I mentioned, um, specifically leaving out the issue of um, hydration really, which is another conversation and um, part of either life prolonging treatment or comfort depending. Uh, but uh, so it's an important conversation. It's just not one that the post paradigm really wants to be reflected on the post form. But this is about artificial nutrition by tube and so uh, again, here the choices really are that some patients, based on their perception of quality of life, may know that they never want to have um, a feeding tube, either nasogastric, Dobhoff type tube, or a percutaneous G tube or GJ. So, um, for example, and I on the next slide will uh, delineate a little bit some of the um, situations where. Uh, feeding tubes are appropriate, but there are many where they're not and where they're not helpful. For example, somebody with dementia um, or very advanced Parkinson's disease um, who is clearly aspirating. Um, when we put feeding tubes in people with Alzheimer's disease, what we tend to do is make them want to pull those tubes out so that they end up uh, restrained. It doesn't help to prevent aspiration. Um, and it really doesn't prolong life. And we have that very well documented in uh, very good studies. And so um, once, if we're gonna have the conversation with somebody who has uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, 
helping them to understand that that's not a helpful thing may help you to arrive at a conclusion that um, they would not ever want to have a feeding tube. There's definitely situations where a trial of a feeding tube would be appropriate. For example, if somebody has a stroke and um, they can't swallow, but maybe in two weeks they'll be able to, a defined trial period of artificial nutrition may be um, appropriate there. I have patients who tell me, even if I have a stroke and you think that I might regain that ability to swallow in two weeks, I don't want you to put a temporary feeding tube in me. So we can be specific about their desires in that area. And then uh, some patients would say, as long as you could keep me alive, if a long-term feeding tube would help me, that would be absolutely fine with me. Situations where they, uh, where we definitely know that feeding tubes can prolong life would be head and neck cancers, um, neurologic diseases like ALS um, or multiple sclerosis, and um, in the acute phase of stroke management. Um, people who have cachexia related to COPD or end-stage dementia, again, we have good documentation and good evidence that say that um, feeding tubes do not prolong life or quality of life in those situations. And so, again, that's part of the conversation that we really owe people if we're talking about evidence-based medicine. The bottom part of the uh, form um, really is not something that I need to spend a lot of time with you on, but again, this is something that's on a typical DNR form in the hospital, and um, it is simply the uh, pecking order of uh, medical decision making. This is important um, from the standpoint that um, the signature at the bottom of the IPOST form really needs to be either the patient or the patient's surrogate decision maker. So the checkbox there is to simply say which one that is. Um, the critical factor for us as uh, providers is to make sure that we had that conversation the right way with the right person. There are all kinds of um, ways that this can fall apart if there are family members or non-family members, um, maybe well-intentioned or maybe um, with ulterior motives who would think that they have the right or the responsibility to sign this form for a patient. Um, so um, in order to avoid those um, kinds of difficulties, really this needs to be the patient or his or her legal surrogate only signing this form. And then on the right side is simply the rationale for the orders and you can check as many of those as apply. Um, the, uh, you want the IPOST to comply with the advanced directives and if there are specifics on an advanced directive, uh, we need to uh, take those into account. Uh, the Iowa law, as it was signed by Governor Branstad, gives the nod to advanced directives if there's any conflict, and we've not found any conflict in our review of the records with the uh, IPOST, but um, the advanced directive would actually take precedence. And people ask me this question too, what if um, the power of attorney for health care um, trumps the IPOST in a situation um, where uh, something is happening right now, and they can do that. So. Um, what you have to follow clinically when a patient is um, deteriorating and if they're not able to speak uh, for themselves is uh, the wishes, uh, their wishes as uh, detailed by the power of attorney for health care. Um, and, and in that kind of a situation where there's some tension, um, you would have to do what the power of attorney says. But what you would really want to do is to make sure that everybody understands that this is the way that the patient uh, and or their surrogate decided they wanted to be cared for in this situation. All right, so um, in terms of the operational um, issues of the IPOST, um, if, it, if a patient's in a facility, the IPOST would go on the front of their medical chart. We put it in a clear plastic uh, sleeve. Um, it transfers, so the, the IPOST belongs to the patient. So wherever the patient goes, the IPOST goes with them. So if they get in an ambulance, uh, you know, what we want is for the ambulance drivers, the EMS personnel, when they show up um, to say, does the patient have an eye post? And if they have one, it's coming with them. And we're not even going to go anywhere until we know that the eye post says that it's okay to go. Um, so whenever they transfer to the emergency room or wherever else, um, it, would, it would ideally go with. That um, eye post can be updated or avoided. Um, if their treatment choices change or if there's a change in their clinical condition. And so what you would do is simply fill out a new IPOST and shred the old one. Um, 
it is not a bad idea at all to regularly review the iPost. And again, it's unlikely that somebody's going to fill out an iPost and it's going to get stuffed away for five years before it's going to be needed because this is intended to be used for those folks who are going to need something in this territory to be asked pretty soon. Um, and then we are doing some uh, data collection and I'll talk just a little bit about that. So the good news about iPost is it works. Um, in our four-year pilot, uh, we did, uh, um, at the time of our review, of our chart review, there had been about 1,300 iPosts done uh, in Lynn and Jones County. We did a random chart review of those, 60-some um, out of each county. Uh, and uh, out of those, I'll just make a couple of quick comments here. Um, there uh, were uh, about half of the patients that did uh, an iPost that had uh, a living will and advanced directive uh, in their medical chart. A lot of the patients who did the iPost who didn't have a living will decided to go ahead and do one. And we found 100% consistency between the living will and the iPost wishes. The treatment that was provided, what we did a retrospective review on these charts. And so if treatment had been provided and, and it was necessary to make treatment choices, there was 100% consistency between what was on the iPost and what was provided. We're certainly aware of anecdotal cases where uh, that did not happen, but in this chart review, uh, we found that kind of consistency, and that's fairly dramatic. What happens really um, sort of statistically nationwide when there's not a document like this in place is that patients get what they want probably about 20, maybe at the best 30% of the time. Another uh, couple of interesting comments to make about the, re the chart review that we did. Um, we tend as providers to kind of lump everything together. Um, when we talk about DNR and no, and no DNR uh, or CPR, um, we, we tend to say that it's all or nothing. What, what, what we realize here when we do a chart review is that about 60% of people who chose not to be resuscitated chose something other than comfort care in, or something more in the area of life prolonging treatment in some other category. Almost 90% of patients who would want to be resuscitated chose something less than life uh, prolonging care, full life, full treatment in another category. So um, rather than um, us making assumptions about um, people wanting all or nothing, it's really better to have a specific conversation about the types of things that they want or don't want. And based on the treatment preferences indicated in the iPost, um, with people who had completed it, 62% of them would have uh, received treatments that they would not have preferred if they hadn't filled out that iPost form. So that's a lot of people and it's a lot of important healthcare. Uh, healthcare providers like the iPost, um, most uh, all when we, um, surveyed uh, indicated that they um, felt that it was beneficial and that we should do it more. Um, many felt that it did alter treatment um, and much of that was in the area again of comfort measures only. When, when you get a patient who w desires comfort measures, what that um, makes you start thinking about is, okay, this is a situation um, ripe for deterioration and we need to have a plan in place for when the patient deteriorates. So if it's not gonna to be to come back to the hospital and do aggressive or standard medical care, what is it gonna be? We don't do a very good job always of talking about that plan B. So plan B might be hospice. Plan B might not be hospice if they're on a static sort of a situation right now. It might be outpatient palliative care. It might be something else. But it does get the flags up and the antennas up to say that this is a person who definitely has some feelings about the way that they want to be cared for that's not in a standard medical way. Um, and that's helpful for us to know. So 90% of our healthcare providers that did the survey wish that more patients had IPOST forms. Um, most agreed that the IPOST does provide clear instructions and feel more comfortable knowing what to do when it's available. Uh, and most agree that it makes difficult decisions easier. Uh, the challenges that we have to the iPost, um, again, you've heard me kind of refer to the statewide implementation of this, and I didn't want the scope of my talk today to really be too much about that, um, but the truth is that as we roll this out for the state of Iowa, uh, time and resources are going to be a big challenge because the, even though this was signed into law, uh, and it's overseen by the Iowa Department of Public Health, there was no funding attributed to it whatsoever. So a lot of this is going to um, need to be by grants and by 
um, sweat equity. And um, again, we hope to maintain the integrity of the process um, uh, throughout the whole thing. Uh, but the strength of the iPost is, again, that it converts a patient treatment choice into an immediately actionable medical order, readily accessible to everyone across the healthcare continuum, and it does change treatment. So uh, just a couple more words. There are um, many state organizations that have uh, come together to provide education, administrative structure, and to develop the strategy for statewide implementation. Tom Evans with the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative is coordinating the strategy, and the Iowa Department of Public Health will have the iPost form on their website. Um, those hospital associations and other healthcare uh, associations that you see listed um, are collaborating in the effort as well. And there are the websites for the Iowa Department of Public Health and Iowa Healthcare Collaborative. Uh, there are um, hopefully going to be multiple portals for um, education and for um, working with iPost. So uh, this uh, presentation that I'm doing for the uh, geriatric lecture series is hopefully going to be more widely available, probably in Johnson uh, County primarily or surrounding counties. Um, I'm going to do a similar uh, uh, presentation that will actually be uh, housed within the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative. So um, if you're watching this, you probably don't need to know that, but uh, we intend to be able to educate our uh, providers, uh, hopefully in multiple different ways about iPost. Uh, this is just a word if your community is interested in implementing iPost and you're hearing about this for the first time and it's like, oh my gosh, we didn't know anything about this and we have to get it started. You would want to contact the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative. Ryan Myers' email is uh, at the bottom of that slide. And uh, we can cert there's a toolkit that will be on the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative and links uh, again to the Department of Public Health and other places so that you could avoid having to start all over and may maybe making some of the same mistakes that we uh, have done. So in summary, I the iPost may be used in the state of Iowa beginning July 1st of this year. The best practice we believe is to pursue a facilitated train the trainer model for facilitator education. I really didn't talk about the specific model, um, but that is respecting choices. It's out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, we have two individuals from Cedar Rapids who are actually going to become faculty for uh, respecting choices and they will be moving around the state of Iowa um, to train trainers so that we can multiply the um, train facilitators that we have. And again, I mentioned that the Iowa Healthcare Collaborative will have the uh, toolkit that provides education and resources for implementation. These are just a couple of references for the legislation, the legislative language that uh, the iPost is under. Uh, and then again, the Oregon Health Sciences uh, University uh, website there uh, for the Pulse Paradigm nationally. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you today about iPost.